Heist introduced 13 new NPCs who are part of The Ring, which works out of Rogue Harbor. The Ring is a smuggling operation that accepts contracts from patrons wanting to retrieve, or steal, items and artifacts. Completing patrons' contracts earns you markers, and you can spin markers to buy blueprints of locations that contain interesting and valuable items that you can then keep for yourself. While there's still mystery around the origins and leadership of the Ring, I want to discuss the members. While some of the members have connections to others, many of the members' stories are unique and disconnected from the rest of the Ring. This video might feel like a list, but I'll draw connections where possible between the stories. Karst is an Oriathan who used to run with a gang back in the alleys of Oria. While he acts tough, Kurai says he's not as tough as he thinks. He also flirts with every woman in the ring. His contracts all involve his old gang and his lockpicks. Right before his exile, one of the members of his gang stole his favorite lockpicks. Our first contract is to retrieve them. His second contract, Karst wants to send a message to the gang by returning the lockpicks they had stolen, but now coated in a deadly substance called the Kiss Goodnight. The poison works, but another old member takes credit for this killing. That doesn't sit right with Karst, so our final contract with him is to kill the person who stole Karst's credit for the first kill. Tibbs is a very large man, also from Oriath, who was once part of a circus as a strongman. He joined when he was only 13, as he was already taller than most adults. Apparently, he met Talina there. He also helped raise a girl named Opal, who was brought to the circus as a baby. Opal has red eyes, pale skin, and white hair. While we haven't seen anyone else with similar albino features, Opal's appearance may have some significance. I do wish there was more expansion on Opal, as she seems like an interesting character. Tibbs's contracts revolve around finding and protecting Opal. Since Tibbs's exile, he's been worried about her. Tibbs has anxiety, getting nervous before heists and wanting bubble baths after. His first contract asks us to track Opal down and we find out she's been living with former members of the now disbanded circus. His second contract has us bring Opal almost all of Tibbs' wealth, so she can take care of herself and hide from the Templars, who are apparently very interested in finding her, living up to the name Daddy Tibbs in more than one way. Talina, as mentioned, was once part of the circus in Oriath with Tibbs. She doesn't mention this herself. She does mention, at the end of a grand heist, that she and Tibbs once created a burning pond, which I'd love to know more about. She seems very guarded and hates asking us for help. Back in Oriath, she was engaged to a man from a well-off family. This was disapproved of by his family, but their engagement now seems impossible since Talina was exiled one week after he proposed. Talina wants us to find and steal the wedding dress Mervale wore when she married Doresso. Doresso and Mervale are some of the most recognizable characters in Path of Exile. For a brief recap, they were married around the time of the Purity Rebellion and recent Cataclysm. They did live on Oriath. Doresso was the champion of the arena, a gladiator of great acclaim. Mervale was a beautiful woman who caught Doresso's eye during one of his fights. He proposed to her, and one of his wedding gifts was a necklace called the Star of Rayclast. The jewel in the necklace was a virtue gem, and that gem had once been embedded in a famous opera singer's throat. When Mervale put the necklace on, with that gem now resting on her throat, she began to turn into a siren. Doresso left to find a cure for Mervale's transformation, and while he was gone, Mervale tried to find him, swimming across the sea in her squid-like siren form, taking refuge on the southern beach of Rayclass we know as Siren's Cove. Apparently, her wedding gown was extravagant, needing six people to carry the train. We retrieve the gown for Talina. After this, Talina has Focano's people tracking her fiancé to make sure he doesn't cheat. He doesn't, but apparently he is miserable. Talina decides it's selfish to continue the engagement when the circumstances are so difficult. For her second contract, we return her engagement ring. She does keep the dress, of course. Huck was once a Blackguard soldier in Oriath, 
like Gravisius. He served in the Oriath III for five years. He was dishonorably discharged from the Black Guards, but does not expand upon why. He is very friendly to us and to all members of the Ring. Some people believe Huck could be the boss of the Ring because he doesn't appear in the official heist images with the other rogues. If you've seen my other video, The Boss, I don't know if I agree, but he does say it's not easy to make friends at his age, which confirms he's at least old. Huck's contracts revolve around a black guard named Enoch. Before Huck was discharged, his friend Enoch was assigned to a special unit under Piety. He never got to say goodbye to Enoch, so he asked Fakano to find his whereabouts, but there were no traces. So our first contract from Huck has us break into the Blackguard Records office to find Enoch. We do, and it turns out Enoch was in an unspecified research unit with piety and died a month after his assignment. The cause of death was a severe reaction to subdermal augmentations. Piety was trying to turn Enoch into a gemling. We've seen the carnage of piety in her experiments. Just look at the mess she left in the Lunaris temple. Huck asks Fakano to inform Enoch's family what happened to him. Apparently, the Templars hadn't even told the family Enoch was dead. For our second contract, we retrieve Enoch's remains to return to the family. Huck is a very patient and kind man. He is also the only one who seems to entertain Isla's insane ideas and contraptions. Niles also worked for the Templars, but in a very different capacity. He used a device called the Thought Extractor to interrogate people before they were exiled, to draw out confessions of their crimes. It seems these interrogations went beyond questioning, likely into torture, as he tells us he may have interrogated us, but if he doesn't remember, we probably broke easily. Niles is a conspiracy theorist who refuses to believe that gods exist. He believes powers that be simply use gods as a way to instill fear and control the masses. He was once stabbed by a Karui man for questioning how that man could be sure that Tukahama existed. He is, unsurprisingly, disliked by the other rogues. Even Vindari doesn't want to work with Niles. Before we talk about his contracts, Niles is the first rogue we've discussed to have dialogue options not related to the boss or their own contracts. One of these dialogues is The Outer Realms, where Niles tells us that he was working when High Templar Venarius was in power. Venarius was introduced in Synthesis League as the ghostly figure Kavas. In that state, he had lost all his memories, but we learn that High Templar Venarius had hired Xana's father, Valdo Caesarius, to rebuild an ancient map device found on Rayclast. Valdo, while working on the device, would fall asleep and enter another realm, which he named the Dreamlands. Here, in his dreams, perhaps nightmares, Valdo met the Elder. If you'd like more details on this, you can watch my Shaper video, which I'll link below. It's a long story, but High Templar Venarius got tired of waiting for Valdo to finish the map device. He imprisoned Valdo and demanded that he be taken to the Dreamlands to meet the Elder, or he would kill Xana. Once in the Dreamlands, the Elder convinced Venarius to free him from his prison, allowing the Elder's mind and body to reunite and restart his havoc upon the world. Since this was the end of Venarius as he was known, it's interesting what Niles recounts to us about the High Templar. Niles says that he briefly saw an image from the High Templar's mind. A simple picture, a single beleaguered jewel adrift on an ocean of madness. Niles says he saw this glimpse because Venarius was feeling an intense fear. Niles' interpretation of this vision is that it's how Venarius sees the world and that, if that was how I saw the world, it would almost be a comfort to believe in gods. A single jewel drifting in an ocean of madness could mean many things. It could be Rayclast, surrounded by the many mysteries outside of it. It could be a virtue gem, alone in the nightmare. My personal interpretation is that it's the Dreamlands, the epicenter of all thaumaturgy, from whence the Elder came, deep in the center of the Atlas. Xana does mention, often, that the Atlas causes madness. 
but how could Venerius have such a vision if he had never been to the Dreamlands but for that one time, which was his demise? I would love to know what Venerius' thought means and what it represents. Is it as simple as a belief system about the world, or is it a representation of a place? A destiny? Niles' contracts are all about disproving the gods and their power. The first contract is to retrieve his thought extractor from the Templars, as he wants to use it on people who think they saw Kitava rise. When we retrieve it for him, he uses it and his disappointed people still believe in Kitava. He says we need to force confessions out of them about the truth, which supports that Niles didn't simply interrogate people. His second contract, my personal favorite, is to retrieve an Asmeri artifact called Viridi's Finger. It supposedly makes giant plants grow just like Oshabi's garden in Harvest. He wants to prove it doesn't work. Unfortunately for Niles, it works wonderfully, so he assumes it's some sort of hypnotizer or illusion machine and decides to destroy it so no one can be fooled by it again. Vindari is an older gentleman from Oriath. He claims that no one knows more about the explosive arts than himself, which makes me wonder if he ever met Nico. He was exiled for trying to blow up the High Templar's office, going underground and leaving a trail of blue stuff, which is Azerite, with a big pile under where he believed the Templar's office was. He was caught by a man he claims was taller than Tibbs, who he thought was saving him. He had accidentally lit his trail of blue explosive stuff, but when the man reached out a hand, he cuffed Vindari. Vindari probably has the best voice lines of the group because he is incredibly forgetful in a delightful way. He confuses Talina with Isla and, when corrected, assumes Talina is some cool new slang. His contracts are all about creating a new explosive. The first contract has us fetching supplies for him, including vitriolic talc. In Act 3, we retrieve something called Infernal Talc. One half of the explosive Diala creates to blow up the sewer blockage. Apparently, he forgot to ask for one ingredient. Our second contract, we get this missing ingredient, Fumarol Tar, and Vindari uses it to create the Vindari Bomb. He tells us he's going to test it right now, and I presume there's supposed to be an explosion or something here because he says he created Explodey make good lookers, which are probably fireworks. Vindari tells us he hopes we enjoyed it, but we don't actually see anything. Maybe that's the point, or maybe something was supposed to happen. Who knows? Gianna was once an actress in Oriath theaters. She was exiled for pecuniary lust, or a lust for money, before being found by the boss. She has portrayed many famous women from history, including Chevron, Diala, and Mervale. She was nearly nominated for Atario in that last role, which must be an award for the arts named after the famous poet Victario. Victario comes up amongst the rogues many times. Victario helped High Templar Vol successfully execute his Purity Rebellion, so it's not surprising he is well remembered in Oriath, the Templar nation. Gianna found a play written by Bestel, an NPC from Lion Eyes Watch, floating in the water. Apparently the play is not particularly engaging and has a frankly unhealthy focus on the female lead's figure in the stage direction. This isn't surprising given that in Act 6, Bestel asks us to retrieve one of his manuscripts titled Cedric and the Buxom Stranger. Gianna's first contract is about a much more interesting play, an infamous and cursed play that no performer should ever name, lest they end up consumed by the phantom that haunts it. The author of this play was apparently high as an eagle on Urgot while writing it, and died after penning the final word. Urgot is a fungal disease in grains and what LSD is derived from. In synthesis, one of the memories is about a man who fell into a cavern and broke his leg. He ate mushrooms and began to hallucinate, so he probably experienced an ergot high as well. I wonder if this memory is of the Nameless Play's author. The play itself is about a young lady who gets swept into a world with cities made of bones under the plains of Vastiri. This sounds like the lightless cities we see in Abyss and Delve. 
She marries a statue and becomes the queen. And then her skin peels off and a hundred little versions of her spill out. Definitely sounds like the author was tripping balls. Hard to say if this play has any relevance to lore beyond the plains of Asteri and the Lightless. We retrieve the play from a Templar vault, and Gianna begins reading it. The lead's name is Marilla, a name we haven't seen before, and she shatters into porcelain, each fragment becoming Marilla, the stage is flooded with Marilla, all is Marilla. I've considered what this play could represent or reference from the history of Rayclast. I'm honestly not sure. All I can think about is Doki Doki Literature Club, but it's Marilla. Just Marilla. Her second contract is much less mysterious. Gianna wants to retrieve costumes that were made by an old, old, old woman, at least 40, for the Theopolis Thespian Society she used to perform with. The costumes were very realistic, and once we retrieve them, Gianna discovers the costumes were realistic because they were real uniforms of Templars and Blackguards. Nanette is the only rogue we can hire for contracts who is not from Oriath. She is Faradun, a group of Marraketh rejects that wander the desert. Nanette has some facial deformity that she covers with her helmet, and, like Spartans, Deformed Marraketh children are left in the desert to die since they are seen as unworthy. Nanette is the first introduction to the concept of Faradun. We have seen Marraketh and even seen babies who were left in the desert to die, but the Highgate Marraketh never mentioned this group of desert nomads called the Faradun. All Nanette wants is to belong with a group of people, to find the home she was denied since birth. She hates the plains of Vastiri, saying those who see it as plains are deluded, as it has been a harsh desert for a long time. She tells us, perhaps we all need a few delusions to keep us sane. What's your flavor of madness, exile? Nanette doesn't have any contracts. She is the only person in the entire harbor who doesn't get a single green or unique contract, which is a shame, because two contracts were planned for her. However, she does get some extra dialogue. The most interesting of these is called Strange Voice, where Nanette tells us that, when we're near, she can hear something, but can't make out the words. They sound like my constant companions. Depression, paranoia, hatred, when I'm at my worst. Be careful, exile. The only other person who has this kind of insight is Tasuni. Tasuni was also rejected by the Marraketh at birth, only he was found by his tribe in the desert, and they took him back in, thinking that was the will of the gods. Some people think the voice Nanette hears is Tangmazu, or the delirium voice. I disagree. Tangmazu doesn't follow us around, at least not without the delirium mirror activated. But we are followed by Sin, and by our connection with the beast and nightmare. Tasuni is able to hear gods, and can also hear the beast and Malachi before we kill him. Perhaps Tasuni and Nanette have some connection. Perhaps the Faradun and the Nightmare have some relationship. I suspect there is a link between these deformed or unworthy Marraketh and the Nightmare. The only other bit we get to know about Nanette is that she might have a crush on Isla. It's cute, but certainly not as interesting as the Strange Voice or the Faradun. Isla is the only rogue for hire who also has a unique contract. She is from Oriath and is fixated on building machinery. A lot of her dialogue with other rogues during Blueprints is about the various machines and experiments she wants them to try or is working on. She seems to have a good relationship with everyone in the harbor, and is even flattered when we take on her contract saying, you want to work with me? I didn't realize we were that close. She terrifies Niles, although it's unclear if that's intentional. Her first contract has us retrieve prototypes of her machines from the Templars, who confiscated them upon her exile. Isla was apparently working for someone bad, although we don't know who. She was either making these prototypes for that person or on her own, and was exiled for the damages she caused while building these prototypes, including a glowing rock that made people sick, which could be sulfite. We retrieve her prototypes, which leads to the second contract. 
Isla can tell someone has been looking at her prototypes and she thinks it's the Templars. The Templars must have lied about declaring my work heretical. They've tried to build them for their own gain. We have seen many times throughout history, people in power who declare thaumaturgy illegal actually use it for their own gain. This is true for Dominus, High Templar Venarius, even as far back as Veruso, the man who founded the Eternal Empire over 1500 years ago. We retrieved the designs for a few of her prototypes, including the Extreme Warmth Beam, the Storm Wooing Rod, and the Mind Subliminator. There is one design missing for a machine called the Unbreakable. Apparently, all four of them are needed to create Isla's superweapon. With the designs for the Unbreakable missing, Isla fears the Templars are building it and, if they succeed, it will be, well, unbreakable. Isla's unique contract has us break into a Templar bunker to find and destroy the Unbreakable. The Templars have created this machine, and we break it. Isla concludes that the Templars must not have built it right, hence the Unbreakable being broken, so she will continue her work to prove it can be done. Now that we've covered all the hireable rogues, let's move on to the people who work in the harbor. Adia is a Marraketh woman who creates the portals we use to travel to each heist. She is calm and collected, even cold to some. As for Nanette, the Faradun, she says she does not think ill of Nanette, she does not think of her at all, and that Nanette will not find the home she yearns for among these scoundrels. Adia has been working with the Ring to help find her sister, Nashta. Adia and Nashta are from a group of Marraketh we haven't seen, who live in the northern Vastiri Plains. I'm not sure if we have any info on this Marraketh tribe, although we do know that the Highgate Marraketh are just one of many, so this concept isn't new information, unlike the introduction of Faradun. We do know that the Sekima before Deshret, Asenath, was the last Sekima of Sekimas to unite the various Marraketh tribes. The wings of Vastiri, an artifact we retrieve for Hargan in Act 8, were worn by her. Since Asenath's death, the Marraketh tribes have been separate. Our first contract from Adia describes Nashta and Adia's relationship. Growing up, Nashta was unable to follow the traditions of our people. She earned many tattoos of shame for her violations. Nashta has left the tribe and the plains with a group of delinquents. They've taken a valuable artifact called Solarized Spear from Hargan. It seems Hargan has a thing for Marraketh artifacts. The spear once belonged to a legendary Marraketh Sekima named Solari. Solari hadn't been mentioned in the game before Heist, but this contract and other items we find in Heist tells us that Solari is actually Solaris, the sun god of the Esmeri and Eternals. There's a lot of evidence. First, Solari ruled the Marraketh along with her twin sister, Lundara. Solaris and Lunaris are also twins. Two of the items we retrieve in regular contracts are the Seal of Solaris and the Seal of Lunaris. Both flavor texts suggest that Solari and Lundara are Solaris and Lunaris. When we retrieve Solari's spear for Adia, she tells us the spear is a tremendous weapon, one fit for a goddess. And its flavor text says that Solari and Lundara were gold and silver, just like Solaris and Lunaris. Since Tangmazu, the delirium voice, is known for turning the sisters against one another, starting their eternal war, Solaris and Lunaris working together to unite the Marraketh must have happened before this fight. But how could Solaris and Lunaris be both rulers of the Asmiri and rulers of the Marraketh when they are distinct peoples? There have been no other apparent connections between these groups. Were the Marraketh once part of the Asmiri? Did the Marraketh come before the Asmiri? When Tangmazu turned the sisters against each other, they were Asmiri gods. Ralakesh, a Vol god who Tangmazu refers to as brother, enslaved so many Asmiri for his experiments, he ran out and began enslaving his own people. There's also never been any connections between the Marraketh gods and Vol or Asmiri gods. We see multiple rivalries between gods of different people. 
Ralakesh for one, but also Arakali and Grethkol, or Rizlatha and Tukahama. But the Marraketh gods had previously been isolated. Hopefully we learn more about their significance and how it's possible that Solaris and Lunaris could rule both the Azimiri and the Marraketh before they turned on each other. Adia returns the spear to her Akara, knowing Hargan will be upset it's missing. Nashta retaliates by attacking caravans with her bandits, but wearing the colors of Adia's tribe. Nashta knows that will implicate Adia's tribe in these crimes. Adia thinks Nashta is trying to start a war among our people. The second contract has us retrieve Nashta's war plans as evidence that it was Nashta and not Adia behind the attacks. Finally, Adia admits that Nashta must be stopped and we must be prepared to fight if she will not listen to words. She will not listen, so we fight and kill Nashta. This seems like the most desirable end for both Adia and Nashta, as now Nashta can be seen as a true warrior, a Dakara, who fought to the death with honor. Fukano, the barber, is a Karui man who trades in gossip and information. Fukano can sell us information about grand heists, revealing extra information about the layouts. Being Karui, Fukano is horrified when Kitava returns, as this indicates doomsday. He's also upset when we kill Tukohama, telling us that the gods were once just stories, moral lessons, and now we've got characters coming to life. And then you're killing them. You're killing our heroes. Tukohama was one of the good guys. There is one benefit to Kitava's return and eventual demise, which is the Karui slave uprising in Oriath this causes. Fakano suspects the former slavers of Oriath won't simply cut their losses, that the slavers see this as revenge and will torture and kill captured slaves. This leads to the first contract, where Fukano wants to track down a man named Happy Happy who has gone missing. Happy Happy was helping freed slaves settle in Rayclast. Unfortunately, we find that he has been killed, which Fukano calls just another line on a page in a book writ only of atrocities against the Karui people. The second contract has us break into the Oriath records office to discover who killed Happy Happy. Since many Kauri are being captured, but the methods used are similar among different incidents, Fakano suspects that one person may be behind these kidnappings and murders. We find the records and discover Frederick Tarolo seems to be organizing these acts. He was a small-time but cruel slaver who left his mark on the backs of many Kauri. He has hidden in a cave, declaring himself the supreme ruler of the slavers, enjoying the lawlessness Wrath's collapse has brought to a sickening degree. We find him and kill him, and whether we did it for ourselves or for the Karui, the message is loud and clear to those who care to listen. The Karui people are a free people. Hopefully this remains true, although such a bold statement could be setting up something in the future with the Karui. Perhaps they will retaliate against the remaining Oriathans, or it could be that they come to power in PoE 2. What's interesting is that Fukano, a proud Karui, stands next to Faustus in the Rogue Harbor. Faustus is a pompous captain of the Oriath Navy who acts as our fence, using his status to justify confiscating illicit goods from pirates, aka the Ring, without raising suspicion. He is still very involved in the Oriath Navy and civilian life. While he seems jolly enough, he is very ambitious. The first of Faustus's contracts is to find dirt on the Admiral of the Oriath Navy, named Darna. While aboard his own ship, the Fair Marilyn, Faustus saw Theopolis ravaged by Kitava and proclaims himself lucky to have been at sea as what those savages did, referring to the Karui slave rebellion, it is indefensible. His ship, the Fair Marilyn, is yet another reference to the poet Victorio of the Purity Rebellion. Victorio had a lover named Marilyn who was a skilled fighter in the Grand Arena. She helped Victorio in the rebellion but was killed by Diala during it. It's a bit ironic that Faustus's ship is named after a famous rebel when he has such an issue with the current Karui Rebellion. Even though Theopolis is in ruins and the Templar theocracy with it, 
the Oriath Navy is still running. Faustus wants to find dirt on Admiral Darnaw, as he thinks he's a fool, a bumpkin, a cretin. One of Faustus's main complaints is that Darnaw holds no regard for a man's heritage. The Navy used to be exclusive to well-bred Oriathan elites, and now Darnaw is allowing fellows from completely inconsequential families to strut around the cabins like they work there. Because they do. God forbid lower-class people working on a ship. Not even Karui or other peoples, just lower-class Oriathan citizens. Not even being captains. The horror. As you can maybe tell, I'm not a fan of Faustus. He's a bigot. But we don't have a choice. So we go rummage in Darnot's belongings for damning documents. We do find some love letters to Piety, Dominus's right hand, and a former escort. This isn't enough for Faustus, as apparently nearly everyone had their hand in Piety's cookie jar, so to speak. However, we do find evidence that Darnob was working with the Brine Rot Pirates, the warband that Guff was a part of before the Syndicate, and Whalem Roth once led before his sister marooned him and left him for dead. Somehow, Darnall working with the Brine Rot is totally different from Faustus working with the Ring, and Faustus moves forward with blackmailing Darnall. When Faustus confronts Darnall with this evidence, Darnall just shrugs and asks if he's going to be arrested. Faustus is furious because now Darnall is withholding orders from himself or any other Navy vessel for Faustus. Now in the dark, Faustus decides to plant this evidence in a man named Captain Fidium's home. Fidium is clean as a whistle and already suspects Faustus of underhanded dealings, the clever sod. He wants us to put the Darnaw evidence in Fidium's home, although he's not sure if the desk or latrine is better. We leave the papers on Fidium's desk and find orders from Darnaw to Fidium while leaving this blackmail. Faustus suspects Fidium will confront Darnaw, but now Faustus also knows where Darnaw is located. So for our final unique contract, Faustus asks us to kill Darna. We track him down and kill him, and Faustus declares he will now be Admiral Faustus. He's going to raid Fidium's place and use the damning evidence we placed to convict Fidium and seal Faustus's new position. Now he has the largest military force and center of all trade working under him. Cool. Finally, Kurai, the administrator, has contracts for us. When we first meet her, she tells us that to activate a rogue marker portal, we must think the phrase, The ring binds us all, and to all within I shall do no harm. Kurai grew up in Oriath, but doesn't like to discuss her youth, except that she did what she had to do in order to survive, and that she's glad that time is behind her. It's implied only Fakano and Kurai have met the boss personally, and they are both Karui. This does support the idea that Kurai may have been the boss all along. Kurai also tells us the boss learned a great deal about the power of anonymity and mythos from Dominus. So maybe Kurai created the myth of the boss, like the figureheads Niles complains about. Kurai's first contract has us retrieve a book named O Eternal, written by the poet Victorio after Kaum defeated Lionai in the Purity Rebellion. The book is in the possession of an Oriathan nobleman. We steal it, and it seems to be a love poem from Victorio to Hiri. Don't worry, Victorio and Marilyn stopped being lovers before her death, so Victoria wasn't cheating on Marilyn with Hiri. But this potentially romantic relationship between Victorio and Hiri is a new concept. It turns out the Oriathan nobleman who owned O Eternal is named Victorio Vox, one of the Vox twins. Vic Vox is named after the poet Victorio, so there's at least four references to Victorio within the ring. The other twin is Vincent and isn't named after anyone that I'm aware of. I talk in depth about the Vox twins in my Who's the Boss video, so to spare some runtime, I'll link that video below. The twins want us killed for helping Kurai steal the book. She refuses. They kidnap and kill her cat, Hana. We ambush them at a party and kill them. I know this video has come out as primarily a very long list. Unfortunately, there's not many threads between each rogue. They seem to have their own disjointed stories. 
there is the common occurrence of Victorio, the people's poet. There's the potential dynamic between Adia and Nanette, the Mariketh and Feridun, and many hints at revealing more about the past of the Mariketh. This includes the revelation that the Mariketh were once led by Solaris and Lunaris. There's the nameless plague Gianna finds, which has some relationship to the Lightless, or is just a dying man's fever dream transcribed and preserved. Niles briefly describes an interesting encounter with High Templar Venarius and his vision of the world as a single jewel on an ocean of madness. Of course, Nanette hearing the strange voice when we are around is also thought-provoking, but unfortunately we are left with many loose ends that cannot be neatly packed together. Hopefully these disconnected strands are simply the set pieces for greater stories to come. Choke you down